Okay, then it's with pleasure that I'll be introducing our next speaker now, um, Peter Maslowski. And uh, Professor Maslowski's background was at Miami University and The Ohio State University. Uh, his uh, doctoral dissertation, Treason Must Be Made Odious, Military Occupation and Wartime Reconstruction in Nashville, Tennessee, 1862 to 1865. Um, and he has been with the University of Nebraska at Lincoln uh, since 1974. In addition, uh, in 86, 87, he was the John F. Morrison Professor of Military History at the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College. Among his uh, several books, I'd like to particularly point out two of them. One was already pointed out for the Common Defense and Military History of the United States of America, um, currently or revised 1994. I guess that's the latest edition, 1994, originally 1984 and uh, that's the, uh, the Free Press of New York. And Looking for a Hero, Staff Sergeant Joe Ronnie Hooper and the Vietnam War, co-authored with Dan Winslow, uh, University of Nebraska Press, 2004. Okay, so I'd like to mention those two in particular. And uh, although I have this incredibly extensive CV in front of me, uh, Professor Maslowski was most, most insistent that the one thing I should definitely not leave out is outstanding Teaching and Instructional Creativity Award in 2002 for the uh, system of Nebraska universities. And in other words, it, it was his teaching, you know, which, which is so special uh, to him as opposed to many, many other professional accomplishments. And as teachers, you know, I think we can uh, relate to that and, and appreciate that so much. I also wanted to add that he's been uh, co-editor of the University of Nebraska Press series entitled War, Society, and the Military. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Well, so here we are 2,000 years later. And I'm mighty glad to be here 2,000 years later. It means I'm not in the back row with the really old, old people in the last row of that phalanx. Um, I'm also <laughs> mighty happy to be here 2,000 years later because I consider this to be an absolutely special group. My daughter teaches high school history, so I know the dedication that you bring to your calling. And I appreciate it very much, and I thank her for it, and I thank you for it. And a lot of that thanks is um, self-interested, to tell you the truth, because I've found that the better educated the high school students are, the much easier my job is. So um, I urge all of you to keep doing an absolutely splendid job, and I'll keep writing on your coattails. Having heard the first three speakers, I thought I could get up here and give a really short speech. Here it would be. Ditto. Thank you. <laughs> but of course, I really can't do that because I am, after all, a college professor. And when you press my on button, I'm sort of automatically programmed to speak for at least 30 minutes uninterrupted. <laughs> Let me also explain here that I am a uh, McDougalite and not a Herbertite. That is, I do not use PowerPoint. Um, <laughs> In fact, every time I hear a PowerPoint, I think somebody's talking about basketball. As you know, a basketball team has a power forward and a point guard. I don't use PowerPoint, but you did get a Xerox handout. And notice I said Xerox, not mimeographed handout. So I'm slowly moving into the modern age. And I get to talk to you today about the creation of the United States Armed Forces. And the creation of the US Armed Forces was not limited to the American Revolution, as you might initially think. But instead, it was a very complicated process that unfolded in three distinct eras, the American Revolution, the Confederation era, and then on the back of this sheet, we get to the early years under the Constitution. For the Revolution, all of the armed services today consider their official birthdays to date from 1775. For the Army, it's June the 14th, 1775. On that day, the, the Continental Congress adopted the New England militia forces, especially those that were besieging the British forces in, um, in Boston. On that same date, the Continental Congress also authorized the creation of 10 companies of riflemen for the Continental Army. They were going to be enlisted directly into the Continental Army. They were all to come from the southern states because most of the Continental Army was composed of those New, New England militiamen. The, uh, con Continental Congress wanted to make sure that it was a national army, so they brought in these 10 companies of riflemen. The Navy's official birth date is October the 13th, because it was on that date that the Continental Congress authorized the procurement and the manning of two armed ships 
to try to intercept British ships that were supplying the British Army in North America. And on that same date, the Continental Congress also created what was known as the Naval Committee that was to oversee naval affairs during the course of the American Revolution. And then there's the United States Marine Corps, which also has its birth date in 1775, November the 10th. It was on that date that the Continental Congress authorized the creation of two battalions of what were then known as Continental Marines. I, I don't think I really need to point out that we don't have to deal with the Air Force in this, in this lecture. Okay? That would come a much later, later lecture. Um, these official dates are extremely premature. And in many ways, they're extremely misleading and inaccurate because it's almost impossible to say that there was any one particular date that marked the founding of any one particular service, though the reasons for that are different for each of the three services that we're going to be talking about. As for the Army, one of the most critical things to understand is that the United States never had an army, a singular army, an army. The United States has always had two parallel military traditions, two armies, and this dual army tradition emerged during the colonial era, and then it was solidified during the American Revolution. Each of these two rather distinct armies emerged from a separate strand of British ideology, a strand of British ideology that the American colonists had inherited when they came to the New World. And one of those strands came from the group that's collectively known as the Radical Whigs. And the Radical Whigs emphasized domestic, political, and social reliability of the armed forces above all else. Drawing their lessons, which they had supposedly learned from studying the Greek and Roman republics, from studying the ancient Goths and the Germans, from studying the contemporary Swiss, from studying Machiavelli, they had come to two major conclusions. And the first major conclusion that the Radical Whigs derived from these studies was that militias are associated with the preservation of civil liberty and with, and with the constitutional stability. They believed that tyranny was impossible when citizens and soldiers were one and the same. They believed that citizen soldiers were incorruptible because they would have no possible incentive to deprive themselves of their liberties. The second lesson that the radical Whigs had derived from their studies was that professional armies are associated with despotism. Ambitious rulers could easily manipulate an army, a regular army, for despotic and repressive purposes. After all, think of a military force, a professional military force. It has those hierarchical and disciplinary values which make it uh, Tend, uh, it gives it a tendency to obey orders. So if they're ordered to do something, they'll do it. This is one thing that the radical Whigs believed. Also, professional soldiers were long-standing, long-serving, and so consequently the radical Whigs believed that those long-serving professional service, ser servicemen in a hierarchical and disciplinary institution, they would lose all sensitivity and sensibilities about civil liberties. So that's one strand of British ideology that the colonists brought with them. The other strand is the moderate Whigs. And the moderate Whigs emphasized military effectiveness above all else. And the moderate Whigs believed in maintaining, and here's a key word, a small regular army. A small regular army. They believed that you could have a small regular army and liberty. They believed that a regular standing military force and civil liberty, constitutional stability, they believed that those things could coexist as long as you kept that professional army under proper constitutional constraints or restraints, such as the British had done with the Bill of Rights in 1689. Once they had put that army under constitutional constraints, then you could have it in a free society. But the, but the, the, the moderate Whigs went a step further than that. They also said, that in the modern age, and remember we're talking about the 1600s in the early 1700s, in the modern age, a professional army was necessary to protect liberty. You absolutely had to have a professional army to protect liberty. Yes, at one time, you could depend on citizen soldiers because they were fighting other citizen soldiers. And in a match against citizen soldier against citizen soldier, your English militiamen could do 
quite well. But there were professional armies arising on the European continent, and militiamen, citizen soldiers, could not be expected to stand against professional soldiers. So you had to take the raw courage that you had in citizen soldiers, and you had to temper it with discipline, with training, and with professionalism. So in the colonial period, what the colonists did is to combine these two different strands of British ideology. On the one hand, each state, except for Pennsylvania, created a militia system, therefore recognizing the, the, the radical Whig emphasis. Okay. On the other hand, as the 1700s progressed, the mother country increasingly sent British regulars to North America usually in small numbers, but they began to send them none the de nonetheless. The relationship between British regulars on the one hand and colonists on the other hand was not altogether happy or pleasant. Indeed, as you know from studying basic military history, by the mid-1700s, many, many colonists, particularly those who believed in the radical Whig ideology, had come to believe that the king was a tyrant and the king was using that army as a repressive instrument to deprive the colonists of their rights as Englishmen. Those Americans who were not absolutely blinded by the radical Whig's anti-army ideology recognized, however, that it was really British regulars and not citizen soldiers who were carrying the bulk of the combat load against French forces in North America. And that was particularly true during the last of the four great colonial wars, the Great War for Empire or the French and Indian War. In addition to these British regulars, colonists often recruited ad hoc expeditionary forces composed of volunteers and these ad hoc expeditionary forces were used to garrison the frontier, to patrol the frontier, or to conduct specific operations or expeditions against either European or Indian foes. They served for extended periods of time, and remember militiamen usually serve for only three months, so they served for extended periods of time rather than the normal three months of militiamen, and they sometimes began to take on the attributes of professional soldiers because they served for a long time. The most famous example of this occurred during the French and Indian War when George Washington commanded something called the Virginia Regiment. George Washington was so impressed with the British regular army, so impressed with the British regular army, that he sought a commission in that army, that is, he wanted to become an officer in the British army, and several times tried to become an officer in the British army, and he tried to have his Virginia Regiment, sort of a pseudo pseudo-regular regiment, incorporated into the British Army, lock, stock, and barrel. Now, of course, that didn't happen. George Washington didn't get his commission. The Virginia Regiment did not get incorporated into the British regular army. And so, when the emergency was over, the Virginia Regiment did what those colonial expeditionary ad hoc voluntary forces had always done. It demobilized. That is, it had been raised for the specific purpose of the French and Indian War. And when that war is over, it disbands. The emergency is over, there's no longer any need for it. So you have this contested ideology during the colonial period, and you have the colonial experience with both militias on the one hand and British regulars and American pseudo-regulars on the other hand. It, it comes as no surprise to anybody that the American Revolution incorporates both of those strands of British ideology. Between 1763 and 1775, the militia, which had fallen on very hard times after, say, 1700, it had deteriorated very badly, so that by 1760 there was hardly anything that might be called a militia system. But between 1763 and 1775, those militia forces, those state-based militia forces, undergo an astounding renaissance. They are refurbished. They are revitalized to protect the colonists against the alleged repression of a tyrannical king using a standing army, the British regular army in North America, to do his bidding. And as you all know, the initial battles of the American Revolution are fought by that revitalized militia. Throughout the entire course of the American Revolution, those citizen soldiers, the militia, perform extraordinarily important duties. I mean, just really important duties. And what the militia citizen soldiers represent is a 
is a mass reserve force. On very short notice, the Americans can create an army almost out of thin air by mobilizing these militiamen. They're not particularly well trained, but they're at least partially well trained, and they're everywhere throughout the colonies, so that no matter when or where you need an army, you can mobilize one without too much difficulty. This, of course, represents the radical Whig belief that citizen soldiers are essential to a free society. But as the war indicated that it was going to become longer and larger, and as the American goal changed from restoration of the rights as Englishmen to outright independence, it was pretty obvious to most people that citizen soldiers were not going to be sufficient, not in and of themselves sufficient. And so consequently, the Continental Congress created that Continental Army. And the Army provides military expertise and military staying power over the course of a long and difficult and arduous war. And of course, the Continental Army reflects the moderate Whig belief that a professional army and civil liberties and constitutional stability are compatible with one another. So under the exigencies of war, the Americans created a military system that blended both strands of British ideology, citizen soldiers and professionals. And these two armies complemented one another. You might think of them as two blades of a double-bladed sword. And in truth, neither edge was particularly keen. Uh, neither edge was particularly sharp. And even if you used them, you know, hack, hack, even if you used them in combination, they usually weren't particularly lethal. But really, try to imagine American success during the American Revolution without either the militias or the Continental Army, and it's virtually impossible to think that the Americans could have won with just one or the other. As for the Continental Navy, when the Revolution began, no one advocated building a fleet to go out and challenge British supremacy on the high seas. In 1775, the British Navy had about 270 ships of the line, frigates and sloops. Those were the three largest categories of warships. About 270 ships of the line, frigates and sloops. And if you added all of the colonial ships of the line, frigates and sloops together. You added them all up, you got to the grand total of zero. Didn't have a single one of any of those three types of warships when the war began. And so consequently, nobody said, let's build a fleet and go out and challenge the Royal Navy on the high seas. It was just an impossible task. This did not mean that you couldn't hurt England at sea. This didn't mean that you couldn't do England harm. You could raid British commerce out on the high seas. And you could also try to interdict or cut British military lines of supply and communication. And so consequently, they created a Continental Navy. Ultimately, this Continental Navy consisted of about 50 ships, although no, no more than 20 of them were ever in, in, in service at any one time. And frankly, most of the ships of the Continental Navy were quite small and of rather limited usefulness. But just as the militia and the Continental Army worked together, so the Continental Navy was not alone out there on the high seas. There were three other main naval forces afloat that were very instrumental in American victory. And one of these was state navies. All the states except for New Jersey and Delaware put a state navy into operation. Now these were pretty small ships and they usually guarded the coast, but they were a valuable complement to the Continental Navy. Secondly, and more important than the state navies, there were privateers. Privateers are privately owned armed ships that go out and try to capture enemy merchant ships. It's basically licensed piracy. I mean, it's really a pretty neat deal. You, you, you basically want to go out and plunder somebody's shipping. So you go to the Continental Congress, or you go to one of the individual states, and they give you a license that makes your piracy legal. This was very, very attractive during the American Revolution. So for example, why you could only get 50 ships in the Continental Navy, and they were always undermanned, there were about 2,000 privateers that went to sea during the American Revolution. And then there was also the French Navy, it's absolutely vital to American victory. You simply cannot, in under, under any circumstances, imagine the American victory at Yorktown 
without the great success of the French Navy at the Battle of the Virginia Capes um, just before the siege began. It's impossible for American to, uh, for the United States to have trapped Cornwallis there in Yorktown if the French Navy hadn't been on the scene. As for the Continental Marines, the inspiration, and this will come as no surprise, came from England. Ever since 1664, the British had been raising battalions of Marines, actually regiments of Marines, for a war. Then when the war was over, they demobilized these regiments of Marines. When the next war came, and the next war always came, they organized new regiments of Marines. When that war was over, they demobilized them. When the next war came, they raised them again. Following British precedent, as I pointed out, the Continental Congress authorized these two battalions of what were then called Continental Marines. Those battalions were never raised, neither one of them. Um, neither one of them. What the authorities began to do was to raise small groups of Marines, wherever they could find men who would join up. Right? And they formed these into very small companies, so that ultimately, even though you didn't get your two battalions of Continental Marines, some Marines served aboard every ship of the Continental Navy. Then what did these Marines do? Well, perhaps their most important role was to serve as ship's guards. Um, discipline in the Continental Navy was never particularly good. In fact, in any Navy of that era, discipline was not particularly good. And the Continental Navy, like every Navy of that era, every crew had its share of thugs and malcontents and outright criminals. And on more than one occasion, the Continental Marines had to protect their officers, the ship's officers, against hostile crews. And that was probably their foremost role, but not their only role. They also served as part of prize crews. A prize was a captured enemy ship. Right? And so if you'd captured an enemy ship, you couldn't leave it in the hands of, of the enemy crew. You had to send some of your own crewmen on board, and the Marines proved very good at serving as part of a prize crew. Then they also provided a ship captain with a pretty good landing party because the Marines were at least a little bit better trained in land warfare than were the sailors aboard a captain's ships. So they did serve from time to time as a landing party. And then finally, during combat at sea, which in the age of smoothbore muzzle-loading cannons was always fought at extraordinarily close quarters, I mean really tight quarters, uh, Marine musketry would sweep the decks of the enemy ship, therefore aiding to the combat effectiveness of their own ship. So that's the American Revolution, and of course the Revolution is succeeded by the Confederation era from 1783 to 1787. And here there's an absolutely key question, and I wrote it out for you on this Xerox sheet that I handed out, and the question is this. Could a military establishment be created that met both the ideological concerns for liberty and the need for internal and external security? Or to phrase it another way, could, could this new national government be infused with enough military power in order to provide for the common defense and ensure domestic tranquility, but without destroying states' rights and individual liberty? Under the Articles of Confederation, the answer, I don't know whether it's that question or these questions, they're basically the same question phrased in different ways. The answer to that question was an unequivocal, resounding no. No, the Confederation government could not do it. And there's several reasons for that. One was the economic problems that the Confederation inherited. You would automatically have astounding economic problems after a long and difficult war, such as the American Revolution. But the Confederation Congress's economic problems were gravely compounded by the fact that it did not have the power to tax. And therefore, it couldn't get money to pay for armed forces. Also, in light of the American Revolution's glorious conclusion, it was really hard to make the argument that you, not, that you needed a lot of pre-war preparedness. After all, how much military power did you have in 1775? Well, virtually zero. And in 1783, who ends up the victor in the war? It's the United States. So why, if you can fight England with no military power and come out successful, why do you now need a great deal of military preparation? When the next war comes, we'll prepare for it. And then there was a third reason. And that was that as the revolution ended, 
the climate was really hostile towards regular forces. There were three events, three sour notes that really poisoned civil military relations. And the first of these was what's called the Newburgh Conspiracy. Now, I think Professor McDougall said that there's never been a serious challenge to civil supremacy in the United States. I might have misunderstood him, but I thought that's what he said. I, it, it might depend on how you define serious, but under the Newburgh Conspiracy, certain Continental Army officers certainly threatened the, conf the, 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 the Continental Congress. There was a clear threat to civil supremacy. And the, the Continental Congress certainly considered it a serious, serious threat. The second sour note was the creation of something called the Society of the Cincinnati. And the Society of the Cincinnati was created to, to form a fraternal and charitable bond among Continental Army officers. Well, who in the world could object if Continental Army officers wanted to join together in a fraternal and charitable organization. The problem with the Society of the Cincinnati was that there were certain elements in it that seemed downright undemocratic. And the foremost of these was that membership in the Society of the Cincinnati was going to be hereditary. Membership was going to pass on only to the eldest male descendant of a Continental Army officer. That means that what the Society of the Cincinnati is going to do, it's going to create a privileged class, a privileged class, a, a class that is based not on merit, but on birth. And that had aristocratic overtones to the Americans. And then the third sour note was a mutiny among some men in the Continental Army. When news of the preliminary peace treaty arrived in North America, soldiers in the Continental Army wanted to be discharged, and they wanted to be paid. That is, let me out of this organization, give me my money, I'm going home. The Continental Congress said, well, we'll give you a furlough. That is, you can go home for a little bit of time, but you've got to come back. And maybe sometime in the indefinite future, we'll be able to pay you. Several hundred Continental Army soldiers became so disgruntled that they actually held the Continental Congress hostage at the point of a bayonet for several hours before the incident fortunately ended without bloodshed. The result of all these factors was a tremendous outburst of anti-militarism just as the American Revolution came to an end. And the Confederation government was unable to maintain more than a minuscule military establishment, and it involved just one service. Under the Confederation, the Continental Navy disappeared. It was disbanded. Under the Articles of Confederation, the United States Marine Corps that had been formed in 1775 disappeared. It was disbanded. Under the Articles of Confederation, on June the 2nd of 1784, the Continental Army is disbanded. All three of those services formed during the American Revolution are gone. They're swept into the dustbin of history. They disappear completely. The Confederation Congress keeps 80 men and a handful of officers. So none of the military institutions founded during the American Revolution survive the Articles of Confederation period. For example, there's no modern regiment that traces its lineage in the American army back to the American Revolution. There's not a single one, because those military institutions disappeared. What the Continental Army was, was not a professional, regular, standing army, in the sense that the British Army had been a regular standing army ever since 1645. That is, it had existed in both peace and war. What the Continental Army was, was another one of those ad hoc, voluntary, expeditionary forces that had been raised for an emergency, i.e. fighting the British, and when the emergency is over, it disbanded and it went home. Now, neither the Navy nor the United States Marine Corps was revived during the Confederation era, but the Confederation Congress did do one thing. The day after disbanding the Continental Army, this would be June the 3rd of 1784, 
the Confederation Congress created the first American regiment. And the first American regiment is the first national peacetime force in American, as opposed to British, in American history. The first national peacetime force in American history is the first American regiment composed of 700 militiamen. It's really a, a hybrid regiment in the sense that it's part citizen soldier and it's part regular. 700 militiamen, um, they're to come from three different states, but though they're militiamen raised by the states, they're gonna be organized and disciplined and paid by the Confederation government. Moreover, the 1st American Regiment is commanded by a, an officer from Pennsylvania whose name was Josiah Harmer, and Josiah Harmer reported to the Confederation Congress, but he also reported directly to the Pennsylvania state government. That is, this was a real hybrid. It had two masters, the national government and the state. It was raised for one year. When the one-year enlistments expired in 1785, the Confederation Congress continued the regiment, but it made it a strictly red, a regular force. It did away with all mention of the militia. Instead, it said the Confederation Congress, under its direct authority, is going to continue the 1st American Regiment, and the new enlistments were not going to just be for one year, they were going to be for three years. And as that three-year enlistment came to an end, Congress again authorized the regiment for three more years. So consequently, what the Articles of Confederation government had done was to create a very, very, very tiny standing army. You almost have to put it, the army, in quotes, all right? Because it's only a regiment. It's not really an army. But it is a standing military force. And so I think you could argue with some legitimacy that the real founding of the American army is not June the 14th of 1775. It's June the 3rd of 1784 when the first American regiment is created. You got no Navy, you have no United States Marine Corps, you've got this minuscule little army out there on the frontier. With such minimum military force, the Articles of Confederation finds it impossible to deal with a whole host of security problems. Um, powerful Indian tribes are blocking American expansion into the Trans-Appalachian West. Up in the old Northwest, the British refused to evacuate their, their military posts up there. Under the Treaty of Paris of 1783, end, ending the Revolution, they were supposed to evacuate those posts, but they didn't. And from those posts, they controlled a very lucrative fur trade. They continued to aid the Indians in the Indians' effort to stop American expansion. And indeed, the British up in those posts threatened to contain American westward expansion themselves. In the Southwest, the Spanish exercised similar influences with one additional problem. The Spanish controlled the Mississippi River. And as you all know, all of the great rivers in the Trans-Appalachian West flow ultimately into the Mississippi River. If you don't have access to those rivers and to the Mississippi, you can never have a solid grip on the part of the United States between the Appalachians and the Mississippi River. And then, out in the Mediterranean, Barbary pirates, um, little tiny states along the north coast of, uh, of Africa, the Barbary pirates ravage American commerce, and there's nothing we can do about it. Oh yeah, there's one thing that the United States could do about it, and that's what the United States had to do. It had to bribe the Barbary states not to attack our commerce by paying them tribute. That is, by paying them bribes. Don't attack our commerce, and we'll give you money. And that's how we managed to protect our commerce in the Mediterranean. Not with armed force, but by shelling out money. And then the gravest of the security problems from the viewpoint of many Americans was Shays' Rebellion in 1786 in western Massachusetts. It revealed the utter, utter military ineptitude of the Confederation government. The Confederation government could not raise the money, could not raise the armed forces to go out into western Massachusetts, which after all is not a huge area, could not raise enough men and enough money to go out and quell a revolution in western Massachusetts. The nationalists, those who favored a much stronger central government, fumed. They were embarrassed. They could not stomach 
the Confederation's military ineptitude and once Shays' Rebellion took place, they feared that the United States was on a very steep slope heading right down to pure anarchy. Here's what George Washington, who had a vision of the United States becoming a great empire. I mean, Washington really thought that the United States was going to become a great empire. And here's what he wrote at the, at the time. However, and it's a direct quote, however unimportant America may be considered at present, there will assuredly come a day when this country will have some weight in the scale of empires. You know, we may look pretty weak right now, but there's going to come a day when this country is going to have some say-so in the scale of empires. Uh, maybe, but not if you stayed under the Articles of Confederation. You were never going to be strong enough to have anything to do with any empire if you remained under the Articles of Confederation. So the Confederation's military weakness, its military ineptitude, is one of those things that provokes and impels the nationalists to seek a stronger central government. But merely asserting that the central government had to be stronger, that the central government needed more power, left the fundamental question unanswered. How do you infuse the national government with enough power to provide for security against all enemies, foreign and domestic, without transforming that government into a despotic or tyrannical regime. So this then brings us to the constitutional period, the early constitutional period, and um, the Constitution solves the puzzle of balancing power and liberty. How do you balance power and liberty? The Constitution comes up with a pretty clever, though complex, solution to it. It does this through a separation of powers and then through a sophisticated system of checks and balances. Power is diffused at the first level between the national government and the states. And then at the national government level, it's diffused between the legislative and the executive branches. And in the legislative branch, it's further diffused between both the House and the Senate, that is, between the two branches of the legislature. First of all, it divided power between the states and the national government. The Confederation had done the same thing. There was a division of power between the states on the one hand and the national government on the other hand. But under the Confederation, virtually all the power had been in the hands of the states. The Constitution reverses that. Paramount power goes into the hands of the national government. The Constitution placed limitations on state military power. And here are some of the constitutional provisions uh, that Paul Herbert uh, mentioned that were so important, and you should know them. You should read the Constitution in this regard. It's quite interesting to look at its military provisions. First of all, without congressional permission, states could not maintain non-militia troops or warships in peacetime. They could not form alliances with other states or with foreign governments. And they could not engage in war, and here's the exact wording in the Constitution, unless actually invaded or in such imminent danger as will not admit of delay. So there are restrictions on state power. Juxtaposed against those is the national government's promise to provide each state a Republican form of government and to protect each state from either foreign invasion or domestic insurrection. And most important, the Constitution, most important in regard to state military power, the Constitution allows the states to keep their historic militias. They are allowed to raise militia forces, and they are allowed to appoint the officers in their militia forces. Then the Constitution further guards against despotism, further guards against tyranny, by dividing control of military power between two masters, the Congress and the President. Congress has awesome powers. It can, and again, I'm using words out of the Constitution, it can declare war, it can provide, it can provide and maintain a navy, and it can raise and support armies. And to ensure money for these purposes, this is extraordinarily important, to, to ensure money for these purposes, Congress could lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excises, and it could borrow money. However, no appropriation for the Army, under the Constitution of the United States, no appropriation for the Army can last for more than two years. That was one way to keep an Army under constitutional constraints under constitutional restraints. It was not a living organism in and of itself. It had to have constitutional approval through funding for it every two years. In addition, Congress could
could, key word there, could, underlined for emphasis, could make rules for the governing and regulation of the land and naval forces. Congress could provide for calling forth the militia to execute the laws of the Union, suppress insurrection, and repel invasion. Congress could provide for organizing, arming, and disciplining the militia, and for governing the militia when in national service. Wow, those are awesome powers that the Congress of the United States has, but legislative tyranny is virtually impossible because the President of the United States is Commander-in-Chief of the Army and the Navy and of the militia, and again, here's quoting from the Constitution, when called into the actual service of the United States. And of course, it's the President who appoints officers, though in a further diffusion of power, he does so with the advice and the consent of the Senate. Let me point out one important thing here. The Constitution institutionalizes the dual army tradition. Right? It really institutionalizes it. It puts it into the fundamental law of the land. But in a radical departure from tradition, right, the, the militias are no longer strictly under the control of the states. The Constitution gives the states and the federal government concurrent jurisdiction over the militias. Right? And this is a radical departure from the colonial and the revolutionary experience. So this is one great victory, really, for the nationalists, the fact that the militia is no longer simply a state-based institution. And indeed, if you look at the Constitution as a whole, it is a magnificent victory, a stunning victory for the nationalists. The new government is potentially far more powerful, far, far more powerful than the Articles of Confederation had ever been. And when the new government assembles in 1789, what it has to do is to convert the Constitution's provisions into flesh and blood institutions. This is not done quickly. This is not done easily. But here's the key point. It was done. And let me just give you a very brief rundown of the steps that the new government took in its first 10 years to turn the Constitution's provisions into flesh and blood institutions and I've listed these on the sheet that I gave to you. First of all, it created an agency to administer military affairs. The Confederation had had a war department headed by a secretary at war, not a secretary of war, but a secretary at war, and that had been Henry Knox since 1785. In August of 1789, the Congress maintains continuity by creating a department of war and keeping Henry Knox not as the secretary at war, but as the first Secretary of War. Then on September the 29th, 1789, Congress formally adopts the first American regiment. That, that regiment that had been created by the Articles of Confederation, it is adopted by the new government. And Congress soon augments it with four companies. Additional units are added in subsequent years. By the early 1800s, it is clear that the United States has made the crucial decision to keep a standing professional regular army. That is an army that is going to exist both in peace and in war. Along with establishing a permanent regular army, the nationalists had hoped to bring the militia under federal control. But the militia is such a sensitive issue because it's really at the heart of the power relationship between the states and the federal government. And it's not until 1792 that Congress passes something that's known as the Uniform Militia Act, which remains the basic militia law of the United States from 1792 until 1903. Right, so for more than a century, it is the basic militia law of the United States. No act in the whole history of the United States has ever been more ironically titled than the Uniform Militia Act. I'm well aware that our government has great fun purposefully mistitling laws so that, that they're ironic. The titles are ironic. All right. Nothing has been more ironic than the Uniform Militia Act because if it's one thing that the Uniform Militia Act of 1792 doesn't do, it doesn't create a uniform militia. In fact, you could well argue that under the Uniform Militia Act, the Congress simply abdicates its responsibilities over the militia. What the Uniform Militia Act says is every state can respond to this act as they see fit. And as it turns out, no two states see fit to respond the same way. Believing that preparedness deterred war, 
The Nationalists also wanted a standing navy to match the standing army. But as of 1793, we have no navy. There's no navy. Then trouble looms on two fronts. First of all, the French Revolution explodes into a world war, putting American neutral commerce at risk. And then secondly, before 1793, the European powers had bottled up the Barbary pirates inside the Mediterranean. Now with the Europeans killing each other off, being otherwise preoccupied, the Barbary pirates are able to spill out into the Atlantic and begin to prey on American commerce. So in response, Congress passes a naval act on March the 27th of 1794. It authorized the construction of six frigates. Each frigate, along with a, a naval crew, was also to have a detachment of one officer and 44 to 54 enlisted Marines so that each of these frigates was going to have a detachment of Marines on board. These frigates have an extraordinarily tangled history. It's simply not germane here, but the key point is that after 1794, the United States had a standing navy to match its standing army. And I think that you can say that 1794 marks the birth, the real birth of the United States Navy. And then finally, and neither Professor McDougall nor Colonel Herbert mentioned this war, which I consider to be one of the most important in American history, as the quasi-war with France approached. In 1798, Congress dramatically increased the size of American naval forces, and because the naval forces were getting so big, Congress created a Department of Navy. Heretofore, military affairs, both land and Navy, had been under the control of the Secretary of War, but now the Navy's getting so big that a separate Secretary of Navy is created, and on July the 11th, 1798, it passes a law that organized, organizes the Navy's Marines into a Corps of Marines. And therefore, I think that's the real birth date of the American Marines, July 11th, 1798, and thus it creates, uh, completes the creation of the U.S. Armed Forces. So very quickly, in conclusion, the Constitution initially threw those people who believed in radical Whig ideology into the deepest, darkest, most profound depths of despair. They feared the United States would soon have, and I'll quote one of the radical Whigs here, that the United States would soon have a military king with a standing army devoted to his will, and that this military king would use that standing army to repress civil liberties. Exercising its explicit authority and its ample power the new constitutional government overcame those radical Whig fears. And it created a standing army. The new constitutional government created a standing navy. And it created a Marine Corps. But for two centuries, and still counting, it did not create despotism. It did not create a tyrannical government. Um, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. question and answer, please speak into the microphone. And Alan, you want to make the announcement again for your? It's all right. You're okay. All right. Sure. Uh, hi. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to the um, constitutional division of um, military authority between the Congress and the President. Yesterday, the House of Representatives voted for uh, an official date to end the occupation of Iraq. Uh, the Senate may or may not go ahead, but the President's definitely that said he's going to veto such a an act to his desk. Um, and there's a lot of discussion about um, commander in chief, the Army has one commander in chief, not 435 or 535, or however you want to look at it. Um, I find increasingly, as I teach both uh, foreign policy, U.S. history, um, and also government class, students ask me, well, who is and like, who declares wars now? And it's becoming increasingly difficult to answer that question, uh, both from a constitutional perspective and from a real life perspective. Uh, can you speak to that at all? Well, Congress can declare war, but doesn't say Congress must declare war. In fact, one of the reasons that I consider the quasi war to be so important is that um, it's really the first war that we fight under the Constitution, and it's almost a prototype of most of the wars that we've fought in that it's undeclared, it's a limited war, or as the Secretary of uh, 
uh, war declared. It was mitigated war. And speaking to Professor McDougall's point, there was a great deal of opposition. Remember he said that there's usually a war party, and the war party was the Federalist Party, and the anti-war party were the Jeffersonian Republicans. Uh, so there's nothing in the Constitution that says Congress must declare war. And I don't know what's going to happen in this, uh, this current conflict, but certainly it's very hard to maintain armed forces if you don't have the money for them. And, and the President cannot raise money by him or herself. The, the, the Congress is the only one that has those powers to tax, to borrow money, to levy imposts and excises and so on. And so whether or not you set a date to withdraw, if the Congress does not appropriate funds, I'm rather at a loss how the war continues. Uh, maybe somebody else would have something to say on that. But I don't quite figure out how the war can continue if money is not appropriated for it. Yes, did George? Professor, could you, uh, I guess, uh, provide an opinion as to why the executive could you branch... Speak, speak into, into the, the mic microphone. Okay. <laughs> could you please provide some kind of an explanation, maybe an opinion, as to why the uh, executive branch has never challenged the War Powers Act? As to why it has never challenged the War Powers Act? Doesn't the War I don't Powers think Act the War Powers Act has ever interfered with the president's ability to wage war. But doesn't it limit uh, his ability to uh, send troops into harm's way by providing a, uh, a I, specific time period as to? It, it, it does indeed. But so far, have you found any time when it has limited the president's ability to do what he wants to do? I think theoretically you're correct that it would do that. But as a matter of practical effect, it has not interfered with the president's ability. Unless somebody else has a comment on that. Yes. It's a separate question, actually. Um, would you comment on any overlap that you see between the ideological um, divisions that you saw in the creation of the armed forces and any maybe social or geographical division in the colonies at the time that the armed forces were incepted? I'm thinking specifically of the division in the colonies between the seaboard communities and the hinterland communities that were primarily agrarian and therefore had the most contact, say, with natives or fighting the, the French in Canada? Or um, do we see other kind of socioeconomic um, groups involved in this ideological division between the, the, the poorer farmers and, say, um, a wealthier urban merchant class, especially in the Northeast? Yeah, I think you particularly see regional interests at stake. Um, the, the United States now is a pretty cohesive unit, but say at the time of the War of 1812, I think one of the things that most <coughs> impacts the conduct of the war is the acute regionalism in the country. That New England was a separate region, the Old Northwest was a separate region, the Southwest was a separate region, and they had quite distinct goals and purposes. And I always think of Andrew Jackson down at the Battle of New Orleans. I think it had been months since he'd had a single communication from the federal government. Um, he's actually just out on his own, acting on his own hook or crook, doing what needs to be done. And we tend to think you know, that there was always instantaneous communications. But in fact, it would take weeks, if not months, for communications to get around. And so particularly in the War of 1812, I mean, where are the Warhawks located? I mean, your question is, that's a good question because the Warhawks are located out there in the Northwest. And where are the Federalists who oppose the war located? They're primarily located in New York and New England and some Southern planters. And in order for the United States to carry out an effective strategy, they have to invade Canada. And the most effective way to invade Canada is to go up the Hudson River, uh, Lake Champlain, Lake George, and the Richelieu River and attack Montreal. But of course, to go up that trough you have to go next to New England and New York where there's virtually no support for the war, which makes it nearly impossible to carry out the most effective strategy. So instead, during the War of 1812, we're out here in the Great Lakes area, which is absolutely the worst place to attack Canada, but it's the only place where you had support for the war. So there is a great deal of regional importance and regional influence in the conduct of war. And I think that lasts well into the 19th century. I don't think it's limited to the War of 1812 by any means. Um, in the Civil War, if you look at um, Professor McDougall's handout, you know there's opposition to the, um, to, the, to the Confederate forces down in the South. Right? And that's oftentimes a regional element 
It's in the Appalachian Highlands. Um, at times, the Confederacy had to send whole division-sized organizations, whole division-sized attacks into eastern Tennessee to try to quell the Unionists there. So regionalism is extremely important. Anything else? Right. Yes. Right here. Um, what do you think of the future for you know, the modern-day militia with the uh, National Guard in terms of its increasing role being used in the current conflicts, but also for um, border patrol, dealing with Katrina, natural disasters, or more traditional <coughs> role, um, what their relationship is going to be going forward in relation to the National Army, the Standing Army, in that their role is only increasing and their uh, value is only seen as, as increasing and, and getting greater going forward. What do you see that relationship going forward in terms of their role within the United States and within the military community as well? Well, I'll tell you, I don't mean this in a smart way, but if I could predict the future, I'd live out in Vegas. Um, but, but I don't think the relationship is, we've always had these two armies, and I don't see it changing and just going to a professional army. I think we're always going to have citizen soldiers. I think those ideological debates are still, though they're muted, they're not as intense as they once were, I still think that they're there. And I can't predict to you the exact configuration of the relationship between the regular army and the reserves and the National Guard that's going to come out of the present war. But I can tell you that there'll still be an important relationship yeah, between them, that, that, that it's not likely to go away and they're not likely to be unimportant. Remember, they would have played a much more important role in Vietnam if uh, LBJ had agreed to mobilize them. Now, you do see the problems in mobilizing them. Uh, a lot of these men are policemen and firemen and uh, local government officials and school teachers, and when they're gone from the community, it really hurts the community. Um, but on the other hand, when you mobilize those citizen soldiers, it's very hard for the society not to know you're at war because it is at least paying some modest sacrifice. Sorry, I can't be more explicit than that. It's a great question and one well worth pondering. Yes. Yes. I just wanted to know if there's always been kind of a friendly rivalry between the three branches of service um, early on and then as the Air Force built up. Has there always been kind of a friendly rivalry about where they will be used and to what extent they will be used and to what extent they get part of the Department of Defense budget and so forth? Has that been since early days? I wouldn't even call it a friendly rivalry. <laughs> I think you call it a rivalry. Um, I think if you talk to anybody in the armed services um, and you ask them who's the real enemy, here we'll ask Paul. Paul, if you're in the Army, who's your real enemy? The Air Force or the Navy? <laughs> Huh? Beat Navy. Uh, yeah, those rivalries are absolutely intense over roles and missions, who's going to do what, um, who's going to have control of things that fly, you know, um, who, who's going to be allowed to do this, who's going to be allowed to do that, how much money are you going to get, because that determines what weapon systems you can build. Yeah, those rivalries are not friendly. Uh, they are really, really intense. and and. The fate of the country hangs on those rivalries sometimes because it depends on what you can build, what sort of an armed force you can build. One last question. On okay. That. Thank you. Uh, Harry Richland in my office in Philadelphia asks, uh, how indispensable was George Washington in the development of democratic armed forces? George Washington was really uh, quite indispensable. I can't remember whether it was Paul or Professor McDougal, who talked about George Washington, was it you, Professor McDougal? I think you absolutely stated it, that George Washington, in essence, became the, the cause. Uh, one of the most astounding things is to read accounts as the American army marched from New York down toward Yorktown, where, where people would come out and just stand along the side of the road, hoping to catch a glimpse of George Washington. And it was, there was a, a, a reverence there for them. They would just reach out and touch his, his, his jacket, or they'd hold their kids up so that they could see him. And the fact that Congress, in essence, said, George, do you want to be dictator? Is that stating it too strongly? Huh? 
Professor Maslowski, you might mention in that context Washington's role in the Newburgh affair. Yes, okay, thank you, yes. But they asked George... I'm interested to... in that because uh, one, of the, one of the alleged co-conspirators co happened to be General Alexander McDougall. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no relation. <laughs> Shoot, I forget what I was going... Oh, well, the Congress asked him if he wanted to be dictator, and he said no. But he disbanded, he made that great speech. Yeah, I, I will, I'll get to the Newburgh, but this was a completely different thing. And he said, civil <laughs> supremacy must rule. And then there is this Newburgh con con conspiracy where it dealt with half pay for life for Army officers. The Confederation, uh, the, the Continental Army officers wanted the Congress to vote them half pay for life, and the Congress was not willing to do that. And so they threatened the Continental Congress, and George Washington learned about it. He learned about it, and he called a meeting of all his officers and made this very dramatic speech. He got up in front of his men, and he said he laid down his papers as if he was going to read a speech, and, it, and then he sort of looked like this, and then he reached into his pocket, and he pulled out his little spectacles, and he put them on, and he said, excuse me, gentlemen, but I have grown uh, gray and blind in the service of my country. And from then, he went on to say, this is not the way for an army to operate in a democratic society. You cannot challenge the, the civil government. If the civil government doesn't want to do things, we just have to learn to live with it. And I will have nothing to do with anything that you want to do that challenges civil supremacy. So yes, um, extraordinarily important. Thank you for bringing that up. Did I summarize that pretty well? Uh, it was one of the more dramatic speeches in American history, I'd say. Wait, does he have one more question? One uh, final comment was um, when we think about the Middle East today, we think about how the United States has uh, shaped and influenced the, uh, the orientation of the Middle East. But I think your comments today with respect to the Barbary pirates and their crucial <laughs> impact on the development of the Navy, the second Navy, and also their role in helping to trigger the transition from the Confederation to the Constitution um, shows that at a very crucial moment in American history, the Middle East had an incredible impact on us. It certainly <laughs> did, and I'm glad somebody picked up on that without me having to say it directly. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.